Shalom Aleichem. Welcome. I'm Lisa Newman, the Yiddish Book Center's Director of Publishing and Public Programs, and I am delighted to welcome you to this evening's program, Women in Exile, What Yanta Mosh Can Tell Us, with Ellen Cassidy. Before we get started, a few things. Your computer will be muted and your um, video off throughout the program. You may send us your questions via the question panel at the lower right of your screen. We ask that you keep questions short and please refrain from comments so we can try to get to all of the questions this evening. I'm delighted to introduce this evening's presenter, Ellen Cassidy. Ellen is the translator of On the Landing, Stories by Yenta Mosh. She completed the work as a Yiddish Book Center Translation Fellow in 2017. She's also the co-translator with Yarmiyahu Aaron Taub of Oedipus in Brooklyn and Other Stories by Bluma Limpel, which won the Yiddish Book Center's 2012 Translation Prize and the 2018 Modern Language Association Leviant Memorial Prize in Yiddish Studies. She's also the author of the memoir, we are here, Memories of the Lithuanian Holocaust, which won several national awards. Ellen's latest book, A Memoir About Organizing Working Women, is Working 9 to 5, which was published in September 2022 with a foreword by Jane Fonda. Always a pleasure to welcome you, Ellen. It's great that you are on with us tonight. Hi, great to be here. Thank you so much. Um, really a pleasure to be with everybody, and I want to take this opportunity to thank the Yiddish Book Center Translation Fellowship Program, which is how I found my way to translating this wonderful author, Yenta Mash, and thanks to everyone for coming tonight. Over the next 25 minutes, I'm going to be talking about Yenta Mash's work, her life, the stories and the characters, why Yenta Mash wrote in Yiddish, and a little about my experience as a translator, and then we'll have time for questions and comments. Exile, migration, immigration, these themes have always been very important in Yiddish literature. And it's obvious why, because the radical forces of history have impinged profoundly on the lives of Yiddish speakers throughout the generations. And Yenta Mash is a master chronicler of exile a powerful voice for displaced people, refugees, immigrants, people whose lives are profoundly disrupted by the forces of history. Her work is keenly relevant today, I think, as displaced people seek refuge across the globe. And when I say Yentemash is a master, I mean it. One critic has praised her rare and masterful elegance, her uncanny insight into vast prairie-like swaths of human nature and her unusual heart. Another critic notes her, that her stories form a series of quiet explosions with a tonic ripple of humor. So in her body of work, Mash traces an arc across continents, across multiple upheavals and regime changes, and across the phases of a woman's life, her life, from girlhood to old age. Masha's characters are always on their way to someplace or from someplace. And that's why I chose the name On the Landing, which is the title of one of her stories, for the title of my translation. On the Landing, always arriving or departing, embarking or disembarking. And I'm going to share my screen right now and show you some images uh, for the rest of my talk. Okay. All right, so for this collection, I selected 16 stories from Masha's four published volumes. And I arranged them not in the order in which they were written, but in order of the passage of time from the 1940s through the beginning of the 21st century. And in these deeply autobiographical stories, it's not always clear where fiction ends and memoir begins. Some of them are narrated in the first person, some in the third person. Some narrators have names, others don't. But as we read these interrelated stories together, they build upon one another. And so if Yenta Mash is a master chronicler of exile, the reason is her own life story. So let's look at that life story now. She was born in 1922 in a small town called Zgritze, Zgritze, located in the southeastern region of Europe, then known as Bessarabia. 
just south of Romania. So if you look at that pink squiggle right underneath Ukraine, uh, just west of Ukraine and right on top of Romania, that's where that country was and is. And here are some views of Zugorica. Um, small town in the middle of nowhere. This is what it looks like today. Um, yet this remote backwater turned out to be a fertile breeding ground for her remarkable talent. And I think this is often the case for Yiddish writers. They lived in these tiny remote places, yet their dreams were huge, global. They were cosmopolitans. They were part of the European intelligentsia. They were members of a much wider culture far beyond the boundaries of these little towns. And in 1941, when Yenta was 19, the region she lived in, Bessarabia, was squeezed in a violent struggle between the Soviet army, the German army, and the Romanian army. The Soviets condemned Yenta and her parents as bourgeois elements, enemies of the people, and they exiled them to Siberia. So look at this uh, blue line. You see where she started out and where she ended up thousands of miles away. Um, and the deportation saved her and her family from being murdered at the hands of the Nazis, but nonetheless, it was a terrible fate. The men were sent to the Ural Mountains and the women and children were sent to a settlement deep in the Siberian for forest, a labor camp, a prison, where they lived on the brink of starvation, performing hard labor in the forest, chopping down trees in the cold, the heat with mosquitoes. And Mash endured seven years of air under these extreme conditions and both of her parents died in the exile. Then in 1948, at the age of 26, she managed to leave the camp and she made her way back to the city of Kishinev or Kishinau, right in the middle of that yellow area, um, not far from her girlhood home, which was by then the capital of the Moldovan Soci Soviet Socialist Republic. And in these post-war years, Yantamash became friendly with Jewish writers and participated in the literary doings in the city. And she dreamed of becoming a writer, but she didn't write. And why is that? In part, it was because she was afraid to open her mouth. She had a dangerous resume. She'd been deported as a bourgeois element. She'd been exiled to Siberia, but it wasn't just that. It was also something inside her. She said this about her silence. Siberia persecuted me for years, even after I was released, so I kept quiet. For three decades, she worked as a bookkeeper and stayed out of the limelight, sort of, you know, almost like a, an illegal, you know, an undocumented person. And then in the 1970s, immigration opened up for Soviet Jews, and she immigrated to Israel. She made Aliyah and settled in Haifa. And there, finally, in her 50s, she began to write down what had been hidden inside her for so long. She finally opened that door in her psyche, and the words, Yiddish words, came pouring out. She had so much she needed to remember, to tell, to preserve. As she put it, this is a quote from her, in Israel, the new atmosphere blew away layers of ash and uncovered the spark that had flickered but never gone out. I began to describe a world that had been destroyed, but that would not allow itself to be eradicated. So after 30 years, she finally began expressing what had been hidden inside her for so long. And as the words poured out, her talent was immediately recognized and she received literary prizes and appeared in Yiddish journals all over the world. And she published these four volumes of short stories between 1990 and 2007, and she died only a few years ago in 2013. So she's really a modern writer, a contemporary writer. And On the Landing begins with a story that takes place in Masha's girlhood in Zugurita, and we see how the town was violently shattered at the outset of World War II when Nazi planes came flying over and dropped their bombs. And we then travel by train and by barge into the land of Soviet labor camps, into the land called the Taiga with its frozen steppes and snowy forests and surging rivers. And we enter the labor camp where young girls like Yenta were cutting down trees with handheld two-person saws. 
and then they split and stacked the light the lumber and it was really hard work and when passover comes to the women's settlement there there's no man to sit at the head of the table and lead them through the service the haggadah so the women throw out the traditional ritual and they create a new one of their own and when the Siberian exile ends, we settle in Kishinau in the, in the collection, the capital of Soviet Moldova, just as Mash did. And we explore how the post-war Jewish community is rebuilding itself. And finally, we join the refugees from Eastern Europe who are struggling to find their place in Israel. Now, another writer might have ended her oeuvre with the promised land, the happy ending. Now everything is okay, but that's not what Yentemash does. She does something different. She provides a counter narrative to the rosy idea of Israel as a place where immigrants naturally feel at home and they feel united by the bond of Jewishness. She shows us the challenges of assimilation, the disillusionment and unease that these immigrants experience as they struggle to find their footing in a new environment with a new language, new jobs, new weather, a new hot sun, and the awkwardness of a culture where it's the young people who are now the experts, the young people who instruct their elders instead of the other way around. And this might provide some of us as readers with insight into our own forebears who came to America. I'm sure you've read some uh, Jewish literature about how that happened on the Lower East Side of New York and the the grandmothers who never did learn English, and it was their sons and daughters who made their way and helped them navigate the new land. Um, and also, I think it will provide us all with insight into today's immigrants and migrants into the United States. And you might think that you would not want to accompany Mash into some of these fearsome places that she's describing, but you'd be wrong. Because even in the most harrowing circumstances, Mash is somehow inspiring. Young and old, her characters are solid, sturdy people with a sense of humor. They're survivors, people who land on their feet. Mash shows us that the labor camp was not only a place of suffering, but also a place of life. Um, we see relationships forged, we see inner strength called upon, and we see a ceaseless a wrestling with God. The characters never stop believing in God, but at the same time, they never let the Almighty off the hook for his misdeeds, his many misdeeds. So as her characters struggle to adapt to new circumstances, whether in a labor camp or in the post-war Soviet system or in the not always friendly land of Israel, Mash makes clear as one critic wrote that even under hellish conditions, goodness and beauty can exist under the same roof. Often a kind of special illumination seems to shine forth out of that pitiless darkness. So throughout the 150 year history of modern Yiddish literature, most of the works that were published were written by men, but women were also prolific writers of Yiddish literature. And in recent years, work by women has begun to be brought up from the deep and translated. And from this work, we this translation work, we're learning new things about Jewish history, especially women's lives, as well as new things about the human condition in general. So you can read Solzhenitsyn to learn about the Gulag, but it's Yenta Mash who tells us what it's like to have a best girlfriend in Siberia, or how the mothers in the labor camps always cut themselves the smallest cuts out of the, slight, the loaf of bread or how a young woman can entertain herself with her own thoughts to keep her fear at bay as she walks for miles in sub-zero weather as darkness is falling in the forest. When Yentemash arrived in Israel in the 1970s, her newly adopted country was hardly welcoming toward Yiddish. Hebrew had been selected as the mainstream language, as we know, and Yiddish was seen as an emblem of European oppression, the language of ignorance, passivity, victimhood. Yiddish was not only marginalized, but in some cases actually outlawed. In the early years of the state of Israel, for example, it was illegal to put on a play in Yiddish and Yiddish printing presses were smashed, but Yiddish did not die. As one Jewish historian once said, Yiddish has been dying for a thousand years. May it die for a thousand more. So why did Yentemash write in Yiddish? She knew other languages. She knew Russian, she knew Moldovan, Romanian, later modern Hebrew. 
But for her, Yiddish was a deliberate choice. She remained stubbornly, stubbornly loyal to this beloved mother tongue. Yiddish was a portable homeland that she carried with her across continents, across eras, through catastrophes and displacements. Writing in Yiddish was part of the responsibility she felt to document the world of her youth, which had been torn asunder. She wrote this, our former Bessarabia has lost its Jews and even its name, right? Nobody knows the word Bessarabia anymore today. Through her writing, she said she sought to add her own colorful pebble to the mosaic, the cultural heritage she had grown up with. So for Mash, Yiddish was an essential part of her being and herself as a writer. It was a way to create continuity in a life full of dislocations, to hold on to where she came from, to honor her origins and her people. As the narrator says in one story, Yiddish is my language. In Yiddish, I feel at home, younger, more at ease. Yiddish is what awakens my memories, my yearnings, the rare tremblings of my soul, without which there would be no point in writing at all. And now a few words about translation. Through the ages, translation has always been an extremely important element of Yiddish literature, both translation from Yiddish and translation into Yiddish, because Yiddish has never had a, a territory or a state of its own. Common wisdom is that Yiddish is harder to translate than other languages, and I don't believe that's true. But the myth of untranslatability took hold, along with the notion that Yiddish as a language is inherently hilarious. As you know, much has been made of the difference between a shmo and a shmendrik, a shlemiel and a shlemazel. You know, the shlemiel knocks the flower pot off the windowsill and it falls onto the head of the shlemazel and so on. Ha ha. But for me, Yiddish is a kind of holy tongue. My mother was Jewish, unlike my father, which is where the name Cassidy comes from. And she grew up about around Yiddish and she didn't actually speak Yiddish, but she would sprinkle a Yiddish word here and there into her conversation, kind of like a spice. And when my mother died rather young, I missed these whiffs of my origins. And by studying Yiddish, I was hoping to connect myself with my mother and with my forebears who had come before her. So Yiddish for me was kind of like what it was for Mash. You know, it was a way of holding on to uh, the everyday language of my ancestors in Eastern Europe. And for me, studying and translating Yiddish was a way and is a way of honoring their lives. Um, for me, translating Yiddish women writers in particular is a passion, it's a cause. I've always been drawn to the stories of powerless people, unseen people, unlistened to people. And for me, translating women writers from Yiddish is about reclaiming and celebrating the words of silenced people who somehow broke through that silencing. I think it's amazing that these women did write and they represent so many women who didn't write, women who had to do the laundry. I've been reading uh, an essay by Tilly Olson called One Out of 12, which is about the stunting of women's literary voices. Tilly Olson says that what matters in literature is not only the great writers, not even the good writers, not even just people who write. Also important is what she calls the soil from which great writers burgeon or emerge. So those who write represent all those who did not write. So the voices of women writers in Yiddish are representative of other voices and therefore they're especially precious. So in closing, I wanna take you very briefly into one of the stories in the book, the very first story called The Bridegroom Tree. It's a story about a woman who returns after the war to her hometowns, Goritze, and she makes her way through the overgrown weeds and finds the house she grew up with, uh, grew up in, which is now ruined and abandoned, which is kind of a microcosm of a whole destroyed world. And translating this story, I have to say, was probably the most intense experience I had out of all 16 stories. I really felt as if I was there, right next to the character. And as that character, Esther, makes her way through the weeds, I was making my way through another kind of overgrowth, undergrowth, uh, through the sentences, uncovering their meaning word by word, step by step. So here's one paragraph from that story. Don't cry, she told herself. Don't cry. Just look. Look and remember. She waded into the sea of weeds, and sure enough, 
There was the well, now barely visible in the tall grass. The roof was rusted, the bench was in ruins. Esther bent back the thorny stalks and stepped closer. She tried the crank, but it wouldn't turn. Counting her steps, she paced away from the well and soon found the place where her house had stood. Only the cellar remained, a yawning black maw that she was afraid to enter. Here was the railing of Aunt Liba's front porch where her mother and aunt would sit in the evenings, never tiring of telling the same stories again and again. They were both long gone and neither one of them had been properly buried in a Jewish cemetery. So that it's that ruined wor world that Yentamash brings to life for us. And then she goes on to bring to life many other places and situations that enrich our understanding of history and of ourselves. So I hope you can see how, how that felt like translation for me. So before I uh, we start our questions and our comments, I want to just touch on the Yiddish expression, die goldene Kate, the golden chain, which refers to how Yiddish literature has been passed down through the ages. And each writer adds a link to the chain, and so does each translator, and so does each reader. So thanks to every one of us, that chain is constantly being forged anew. So thank you. And now we can start our uh, discussion. And I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you, as always, Ellen. Um, it's a treat to, to hear this about Yentamash. I love the collection of stories. Um, so we've got some questions. We've also got, because this program, I will mention, is part of the Yiddish Book Center's 2023 um, Reading Groups for Public Libraries program, we've got participants who have read the book through the public library program or will be reading it through their public uh, library. Um, so quick first question, did she marry? She did, yes. She had two husbands. Uh, one she met after she escaped from the uh, labor camp. Um, she married a, someone who was waiting for her in the nearest town of Tomsk mm -hmm. in uh, Siberia. And they went to Kishinev together, went back to Moldova together. Um, and then he was killed in a car accident. And it was after that that she immigrated to um, to Israel and remarried there. And she had a daughter. And uh, I was in touch with the daughter to get permission to translate the stories. And the daughter let me know that she doesn't read Yiddish and she was looking forward to experiencing these stories for the first time in English when I translated them. Um, which of her books focuses most on her experience in the Gulag? Did she write a memoir? Um, that was the first, uh, the first book she wrote was called Tief in der Taiga, Deep in the Taiga. And it uh, contains many stories about her time, uh, both in her girlhood and mostly in Siberia. And then she came back to that topic again in the, the next three volumes that she wrote. So there, the stories about Siberia are, are sprinkled through her work, but mostly in that first volume. If I'm not mistaken, if I may, Ellen, you translated a story that we have on our website from that. No? Yes. Yeah, I thought so a long time ago yeah. for one of our translation issues. Yeah, digital. Yeah. So if um, folks out there are looking for it, if you um, search for Ellen Cassidy on the Yiddish Book Center website, you'll find lots of translations and others. Um, how difficult is it to translate stories in a language you've just learned? Um, well, it's not quite just because I, I did start studying in 1990, so it's been a while. Um, but it is, it's a language that... It, I, is not, you know, I, I'm not fluent in the language. Um, I was raised to um, really treasure the English language. And in my uh, family of origin, we had a stack of dictionaries right in the dining room. We could not get through a meal without consulting at least one of them. And um, it took me a while to realize that it's really my love of English that is my greatest strength as a translator. Um, and that's something that um, I didn't, Real, I wasn't really onto when I entered the Yiddish Translation Fellowship Program, um, but all of us came to realize that like living in English land was really where we needed to be as translators. Mm -hmm. And 
uh, finding out what the Yiddish sentences meant was only the beginning. And the, then you went on to, well, how do we, how do we render this in, in English? One thing that, that I think really helps translators from Yiddish into English is that both languages are what are known as fusion languages. So in Yiddish, it's got a German base, um, but then all these other elements are stirred into the pot, Hebrew, um, Romance languages, Slavic languages, and it's a, it's a wonderful mix. And that gives Yiddish an incredible uh, ability to uh, to say things either in a in a sort of vernacular in a in a you know kind of down home language or in a much more elevated register, and there's a, a great capacity for wit and irony that comes out of that. And if you think about it, English is like that too, because we have um, the Anglo-Saxon kind mm -hmm. of you know base of our language, which uh, we have the Germanic. And then we have the Romance languages that came in with the Norman conquest. And so you can say, you know, you can plunk your butt on a bench, which is like the more Anglo-Saxon way of putting things, or you can lower your posterior into a seat, which is maybe the more Latinate uh, way of, of expression. And so there's a vast, like English vocabulary is bigger than many languages. And um, so when you, you see a Yiddish sentence, you have a lot at your disposal to choose from. You can choose the more, uh, you know, uh, Hebrew uh, more register, or you can choose the, the more Slavic register and, uh, or the Germanic. And, and that makes it just really a, a delicious process. Well, seeing the work that you and the other um, translation fellows and others that we've published through the center's imprint, it's really quite amazing to see the literary translation and to read these pieces and they have the voice, but they also um, feel as though they could have been written in English um, when they're done 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 well, which you've done a beautiful job. Um, she started so late in her life as a writer. What encouragement um, did she have mentors? Um, uh, that encouraged her writing. And, and if I may inject a second part of to that question, Ellen, because you also have translated Bluma Lempel, who also wrote late in life. And I've always been curious if you would talk about that in terms of these two women. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I think it's quite fascinating. And what I this book came out, to say, right during the uh, time of the Brett Kavanaugh uh, nomination process where you had this woman who had a story of sexual assault that she had kept to herself for decades. And right then was when I was going on the you know book tour circuit talking about Yenta Mash, who also kept quiet for decades. You know, for like 30 years, she didn't breathe a word about what had happened to her. And then it all came pouring out. And I think there's something very special about that, those experiences marinating for such a long time. Um, this is different from Bluma Lempel, um, who I translated along with Yermiahu Aaron Taub. Um, she always wanted to be a writer, as Yentamash did, and she began writing pretty young. It took her a long time to get published, but she and and she was kind of interrupted in her literary career by the Holocaust. Um, you know, she had also a, a as history of being born in Poland, living in Paris, escaping to New York, and then being just devastated and, and stopped in her tracks by the terrible news coming out of Europe. And she started writing in a very different vein. She started writing poetry and various things. And then she found her voice um, in writing as a survivor, as a, a remnant of the European Holocaust. Um, Yentemash uh, was part of was always part of literary circles, both in Moldova and then when she moved to um, to Israel, and she was encouraged by Avram Suskever, who was a, a refugee from Vilna, um, Lithuania, Poland, um, and he his his journal was called Die Golden Kate, the Golden Chain, and he nurtured many many writers that we are translating today. Um, and she was part of something called Levik House, which is still going today, a, an organization of writers, Yiddish writers in, in Israel. And she felt supported by the, the small number of writers who were writing in, in Yiddish and not in Hebrew. 
Um, uh, Bloomer Lempel in New York, a place where there were many opportunities to get together with other Yiddish writers, was more of a, a recluse. Um, she didn't take advantage of a whole lot of those experiences face to face, but she did also get a lot of sustenance out of Avram Sutskevel, and she was published in that same journal. So there are these wonderful ties, you know, uh, almost like what we have today on Zoom and through email that you can be in touch with people all over the world. And they wrote letters that are stored in these wonderful archives we have today um, that show us the links among these writers. Will there be any other collections published of Masha's work? Um, I don't know. You know, I read through most of her work and I picked out my favorites. Um, I'm currently working on translating a different author, Rochelle Vaprinsky, who wrote novels, um, a, a novel that I'm translating with my colleague, Anita Norwich. So I'm not working on any MASH translation, but um, it's out there and somebody else could do it. Um, did Yenta Mosh become fluent in Hebrew and did she associate with Hebrew writers in Israel, even though she wrote in Yiddish? I don't know. I think she probably did become fluent in Hebrew. Um, some of her stories are about um, uh, a grandmother in Israel who uh, you know, has grandchildren and um, is adapting, you know, is, is uh, learning to live in this new land. And so I, I believe she became uh, an accountant or bookkeeper in, in Israel. And she was so facile with languages as many of our forebearers had to be um, that I'm sure she, she did uh, master the language and she was, she was a language person. Um, and she also had a somewhat of a, a grounding in Hebrew studies as a girl. So yes, I'm sure she, she did um, get into that, but, but uh, Yiddish was something very precious to her. And which stories or which story do you find most compelling? Um, I find the Siberia stories the most, the, they speak most deeply to me. Um, and in fact, when the pandemic began, I found myself really going back to these stories over and over again, because they, like all the stories, but those in particular really spoke to me because they were showing how people who were really living in very extreme circumstances, way more extreme than I was experiencing, um, kept themselves going and found ways of connecting to each other and uh, finding new rituals. And here I was learning the new ritual of being on Zoom, you know? <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I got a lot of strength out of them. Um, might second time around, the last story in the book, be autobiographical? I think so. That story is about a late life romance, and it's uh, about a woman who's, you know, in her later years, and she connects with a, a man who also, who comes from where she came from in Eastern Europe, and that is a source of great comfort to her, and um, and it, it ends on a, on a beach, you know, a, a very sunny, hot place where people are just having a, a lovely time and eating ice cream. And, and she is, it's a bittersweet ending. She, she sort of thinks, why do I deserve this happiness? And I think that's really a very common feeling among people who have been thrust out of these places, out of places of great tragedy and have survived and have started over again. And they, they always feel a little bit like do I really belong here? And do I deserve to be here? And uh, and you almost feel like she's saying, do I deserve to be so happy? But you you sense this sort of thread of, of sadness going through that happiness. In working on this, did you have to use any historical nonfiction to inform your understanding of her situation? Yes, I, I did quite a bit of reading into um, this land, land that was new to me, Moldova. Um, and I was helped in this by, um, the, you know, you always gather a circle of, of advisors around you when you're doing a project like this. And so Sebastian Schulman was one of my informers. He um, was 
at the time was the director of the translation program. And it just so happened that he had been to Moldova many times and, and was working himself on a project about one of the other writers. Um, I also was helped by my special Yiddish, like the walking dictionary um, <laughs> of Dov Bear Kerler, who was a professor at uh, Indiana University. And he'd been one of my teachers at the Vilnius Yiddish Institute that I went to several times, a uh, summer program in, uh, in Vilnius, Lithuania. And he was an amazing, he knows every word in every language. So I would come across some word, some crazy thing that, you know, was only used on the, in the labor camps in Ukraine or something. And, oh, I'd send him a, a question by email and then there'd be this, you know, immediate answer coming back on, you know, on a text message with a picture of what it was and exactly what the origin of the word was and so on. So that was very helpful too. Um, Masha's characters experience extreme uprootings. How do you feel that they sustain themselves as they make these transitions? And I guess also, um, how do you think, again, Mash writes herself into some of those characters? Yeah, well, I think, you know, the characters, I feel like in most of the stories, she is the main character, whether she says so or not. Um, but uh, I, I think that's something for the reader to to discover and explore because in every story there's there you can just pick out you know what are they doing to get through this horrendous situation um the story where she makes this good friend and they're out in the forest they're cutting down trees and uh they're joking around she pretends she's a priest who's blessing the, the fallen tree and um they're talking about language and they're uh you know, sort of preserving their their mm -hmm. own personalities, and and there's a lot of friction between the two of them, um, and you. It, this is very delightful in the middle of this, you know, freezing cold, and they make a little fire with the um, with the logs. But that's not what's really keeping them going. That's that's keeping their hands warm. But what's keeping their minds warm and their hearts warm is each other. Um, but they're. Uh, or the story about the girl who's walking through the forest at, at night to get home to her home settlement. She's been traveling around selling sewing notions to the peasants who live in, in Siberia. And she stays over in the home of one of them. And she gets some money for writing letters for illiterate peasants who want to write to their, their sons who are on the front. Um, and she's, she's imagining herself back home. And she's thinking, well, you know, what would it be like to, to kiss somebody right now? And, um, and, you know, I'm thinking, she's thinking about her mother and her, how her mother loves to sing and, um, and it just, you know, and she's freezing, you know, but she's going to keep going. And, um, and that's a really delightful kind of heartwarming story in a way, even though awful things are happening, you know, um, then when they get to Israel, um, there's this grandmother who just, she just takes great pride in what she has to offer to her grandchildren. And she's very open to what her, her little grandson has to teach her. And mm -hmm. that's just a beautiful thing about how, um, you know, she doesn't really know her way around this country and he does know his way around in a way that she doesn't. And she can remember back to what, how she grew up, but she also is very much there with him. Um, someone would like to know, um, was life in shtetls in Moldova typical of the shtetls in Eastern Europe, or do you think they were big differences? I think they were typical of shtetls, shtetlach in Eastern Europe. Um, the Zgurica was had been a, what was called a Jewish agricultural colony. So it had been designated, um, I guess, under the maybe the Ottoman Empire, um, as a, a place where Jews were encouraged to come and to farm. And her her father was not actually a farmer, but um, uh, it was that same thing where the um, Jews were a majority of the population as in most Stadtbach. They were middle-class, they educated their children. Um, and it was out in the the villages where there were much few, many fewer Jews, where more uh, farmers lived, peasants, 
Um, and there was, you know, there was a, a mix of people. People lived side by side, um, mostly without violence. Um, there were some pogroms, um, which was true in many shtetlach, although not all. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so, yes, so I think it was a pretty a typical shtet shtetl. Um, and, and then, then I, I would like yeah. to say that Kishinev or Kishinev, after the war, it became a very thriving cultural mm -hmm. place for Jews. It had hundreds of thousands of Jews living in Kishinev, very different from, say, Vilna, which had been, a, you know, the Jerusalem of the north, ended up with, you know, what, 20,000 Jews, very few. I'm going to make this your last question because um, we've peppered you with a lot of questions here. Um, how do the historic descriptions described in Maj's work affect relations between parents, offspring, grandparents, and children? Very, very central. Um, you know, uh, especially especially in every single story. You know? mm -hmm. um, I think in the Siberia stories, um, the the daughters and the mothers are clinging to each other and they're very dependent on each other. And uh, in the case of Yentamash herself, her mother was like a leader of this women's colony and, and did a lot to keep the women going by just came up with all kinds of ideas, like telling her dreams and mm -hmm. which became like prophecies. And uh, so she really helped to keep the people going. Then when in this, the Yentamash's middle years in the Soviet system, when she's back in, in Kishinev, um, that's where you begin to see the, the uh, children of her generation kind of um, coming into their own and making their peace with, making their adaptations to the Soviet system in a way that the older generation, if, if there is any, and there is, um, mm -hmm. they can't quite manage. And so they move into center stage. Um, and so, and that's, again, it's often very loving the way she talks about those relationships. Then in Israel, um, there's more, I would say more friction and more difficulties among the generations. Um, it, grandparents and grandchildren connect well, um, even though they're living in pretty different worlds and have a really different relationship to this society. Um, and so it's more, I, I think I see more in those stories, there is more connection between the grandparents and the grandchildren than between the, the parents and children. Um, the Eastern European immigrants come in, their children grow up in Israel and are really in a different place. And then, but they do, they can find a connection with their grandchildren. And that's very satisfying and rewarding. Ellen, thank you so much for the work in translation, for all of your work, and for joining us this evening. Um, really great insights um, to Yentamash. And the well, work. thank you, everybody. It's really such a pleasure to talk about her and to introduce her to new readers. And there are a lot of new readers reading her work. Again, thank you so much, and we hope to see you soon. Same. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. I want to also thank our producer, Elizabeth Carteropoli, for all of her work bringing this together. Exactly. We wouldn't be on the air without her. Tonight's program is presented as part of the Yiddish Book Center's 2023 Reading Groups for Public Libraries program and part of an ongoing series of programs brought to you live from the Yiddish Book Center virtually. Please join us for a special program on Tuesday, June 20th at 1 p.m. on the Road to Zion, a panel discussion about Jewish thought in Poland in 1905. And Thursday, June 29th at 7 p.m., we'll present Kibbutz and Nosh Cafeteria Culture in 1970s New York City with Marsha Brickner, Halpern, and Deborah Dashmore. Join us for all of those and more to look and see what else is coming up, visit yiddishbookcenter.org slash events. And I want to take a moment to thank all of you in the audience tonight who are members who make our work possible. If you want to learn more about how you can become a member and support our work and enjoy the benefits of membership, please visit yiddishbookcenter.org slash donate. Thanks for joining us and look forward to seeing you Tuesday and then again on Thursday. Take care. <laughs>